Thank you, Sebastian. And thank you, uh, Colin, and the organizers of the workshop for um, the opportunity to be here today. My name is Brian Tom. I'm from the University of Victoria in the Anthropology Department. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here on the, in the territories of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And it's been inspiring to listen to uh, everybody over the last few days and, the, and all the incredible work that you've been doing in your communities. It really, uh, it really lifts us up. And uh, I'm certainly going to be bringing a lot of the stories that I've heard today home. Uh, I want to share with you uh, a, a project that I've been working on, uh, a, more of a passion project than a project that is uh, part of a big research grant or anything like that, around uh, infusing municipal land use planning processes and decision making with an Indigenous sensibility and an engagement with Indigenous communities. And central to this process has been um, mapping. And some of you maybe remember this slide from a couple of years ago from a Cicada workshop when Sebastian and I and others were talking about this uh, mapping access and the various approaches to uh, mapping that, that we've encountered in our own practice. And, uh, and there's a huge range of ways that we've seen demonstrated today from very sophisticated databases uh, to, uh, you know, uh, continental scale analysis to very uh, careful site-specific uh, um, uh, displays. And I think that the project that I've been working on over the last few years, or last, I don't know, 18 months or so, has, has uh, really called on many of these uh, uh, mapping approaches uh, to make a difference uh, in a very local scenario. So I'm talking about uh, a certain place uh, on Vancouver Island, a place uh, in the Senchothan language we call Tzal'ilch. Uh, it's about 3,700 kilometers from here in a straight line if we were to fly. Um, and in English, we, we, this place is named Cordova Bay. It's essentially a suburb of Victoria. Uh, it's about nine kilometers north of the university, and it's where I live, uh, and I'm raising my family. Um, Tzal'ilch is a place that uh, is important to both the uh, Saanich and Lekwungen uh, peoples, the indigenous communities of southeast Vancouver Island. They've uh, been busy over the, the last several decades mapping out their territories, recording their place names, their territorial relations, their fishing sites, uh, in an effort to uh, continue many of the kinds of objectives that uh, communities here have shared to, to have their uh, sacred sites protected, to have their fishing rights recognized, to make space for their aspirations and hopes for, for their communities. Um, and, and so the communities have been very, very involved in, in, in these kinds of, uh, of mapping practices and, 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 and know about their territories. This is also a place um, where treaty making happened. Uh, unlike our uh, example earlier today in north uh, western British Columbia where there have been no treaties. On southeast Vancouver Island there were a series of treaties uh, signed in the 1850s including the South Sandwich Treaty which is essentially the, the Treaty of Tzal'ilch where uh, promises were made to set aside uh, village sites and enclosed fields to uh, recognize and, and accommodate uh, hunting and fishing practices in perpetuity. Um, and in the case of uh, Tzal'ilch, none of these promises have really been fulfilled. There were never any reserves created in the area. Uh, the area has been almost entirely taken up by urban development uh, and uh, local uh, uh, a landfill, uh, some small local parks and so on. Um, and so it's a place where the communities uh, certainly have been alienated for, uh, for many generations from, 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 their, from living out their, their aspirations in these, in these territories. But the story that I want to tell today just starts with me going as a, as a, a resident in the community to uh, a, a, a meeting that local government, the municipality, municipality had uh, to discuss land use planning. It had been 20 years since the municipality had updated their land use plan. They were reviewing the zoning, the transportation, housing density, uh, park management, all the kinds of standard things that municipal governments uh, draw into their land use plan. And I was there as a fairly new resident and I, asked, and I listened, and, and nowhere in their, in their uh, presentations and considerations were there any 
consideration or even mention of indigenous peoples and their history and their place and their presence and their vision of the future for their territories. It was completely absent. There was nothing. And so I asked, uh, have you thought about contacting the indigenous communities? And, uh, and I heard that, um, well, there were no Indian reserves in this area, so we didn't think it was our problem. Um, and so I said, well, you know, we might want to do some work together to indigenize your land use plan. And uh, at, at about the same time, I was, uh, I was walking across campus at UVic, and, and I, I had the opportunity, I was walking with a linguist, and she pointed out to me, she says, oh, you're in Cordova Bay. Have you ever thought about that pole, that totem pole uh, in the campus courtyard? It it's, tells the story um, of the giant Smokwits who threw a boulder across from where the Tawasan Ferry Terminal is on the mainland and transformed two people into stone who had violated a, a sacred uh, uh, promise that they had made. And that's the story that, that happened in Cordova Bay. And so this sort of non-Western spatial uh, mapping uh, started to bring some things into focus. And then I started looking at it, going to the archives, looking at what other kinds of mapping have been done in Cordova Bay, and it, I realized that there had actually been all kinds of documentation of archaeological sites in the Cordova Bay area, none of which had made it into the Provincial Archaeological Registry. Something like 30 sites had been documented between the 40s and the 80s, um, but not at all uh, um, visible to developers and planners and the municipal government because they didn't make it into the registry. And in fact, there was a large uh, mall development planned um, at a place where the newspapers only 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago were showing all the graves that were exhumed and, and um, uh, obliterated uh, as the previous owners had made way for their development. So this is a local community that they were violently removing these, the, the grave sites of the, of the people of Tzal'ilch to make way for beach houses and shopping malls. So we worked together to try to ignite a kind of archaeological assessment. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, I think the sort of the lowest bid uh, archaeologist won the job and, and they didn't find anything uh, at the site and the, and, the, and the site has been obliterated. Um, over the past months, but this helped trigger further dialogue, a further urgency for conversations with the community. So we went and I spent some time in the archives uh, and, and have uh, been able to pull together uh, a whole series of information that were neither in the, in the indigenous community's own database or, or the one that the governments were using and planners using to, uh, to see, uh, to, to make their decisions about these kind of issues of zoning and so on. So the archaeological landscape uh, and, and the sacred sites are, are, were very, very important. This is an example of the archaeological maps that they, the, some of the ones that, of the sites that were recorded, just uh, uh, utterly inadequate, uh, calling for uh, a renewed attention to these kinds of archaeological landscapes. We also found a, 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 f a fish trap. What's that? No, we're okay. Um, we also found a stone fish trap. Uh, an incredible rock feature, the kind of the shape of a cursive M that uh, right at the mouth of a, of a freshwater creek uh, I inside a tidal lagoon that had never been documented. But when I started talking about this with people in the community, they, they certainly remember when they were younger going to this area and harvesting crab and, and, uh, uh, and seaweed and, and other um, uh, foreshore resources uh, that, were, that are very important from this area. So uh, one of our works uh, the first week of June this summer is going to be to go back out here for, with youth from the community and properly document uh, this tidal trap and hopefully collect some uh, samples for radiocarbon dating. We also found maps that, uh, of a Spanish, uh, when the Spanish uh, floated by here in 1791, uh, uh, were, were violently repelled by the people of Tzal'ilch and actually uh, and left the area. Um, we found a number of maps from the very beginning of the colonial area, era, uh, which showed extensive set of trails that linked the, what are now the present day reserve communities, both to the north and to the south of Cordova Bay, with, uh, with, the, with the, um, the, the, the main village of Tzal'ilch in the, in the middle. And these maps of these uh, so-called Indian trails are very exciting in the communities. They're very, very interested in, in, in where these trails actually are. We've managed to use, uh, uh, overlay them and, and relate them to the contemporary landscape. So all of this mapping has produced a new conversation, a conversation which uh, will actually uh, 
uh, have uh, come to a, a head on the 14th of May. Uh, we're having our f the first ever meeting of the leadership of the Saanich communities and the municipal government to talk about land use planning. Municipality is over 100 years old. This is the first time that we've ever had this discussion. And uh, it's, uh, we're very excited about the event. There's lots of things that I've been hearing over the last few days about uh, uh, the way these political processes are going to go, where I can see the, the, the pushback from the, and the risk management and so on happening from the municipal government. But I, I'm encouraged that there are good people with good intentions who, who, uh, who hopefully will um, work to incorporate these kinds of values into, uh, into their plans for the space. We also recognize that even in the Indigenous communities' own maps, that there's lots more work to do on, uh, on land use and occupancy uh, on mapping. Um, and so we're hoping to, um, to do that, including some drone surveys that our, my graduate students have been working on, uh, looking at intertidal resources, particularly a culturally significant seaweed, and training computer models to visualize that. So finally, I just end with this slide, which uh, uh, I raise some of the some of the kind of questions about the next steps. You know, what are the sort of issues that this kind of mapping engagement? Uh, uh, what are the kinds of questions that these kinds of mapping engagement raises? Uh, how can we bring uh, indigenous values into into zoning, municipal zoning, and decision making? What are the kind of legal mechanisms for that, and uh, and political mechanisms? What are the future visions that indigenous communities have to see themselves in this otherwise urban landscape? to reassert their presence there, to respect their treaty rights, to reignite the ability to practice their treaty rights. Um, and, and, and very local questions have come out of the dialogue, like uh, who, who carries the ancestral name for this place today? Who's, who's the bearer of the, uh, the hereditary title of the person who we know was the owner of these, of these territories in the past? Where is that rock that the giant smock quits through? You know, which one of the boulders on the beach is it? People are very motivated to go out there and do that. And, and so I'm looking forward to, uh, to, these, uh, uh, to continuing on the ki this kind of uh, very small-scale mapping work, which I think can uh, have a big difference in our communities. Thank you.